All right, so everybody, thanks again for joining. My name is Gage Ryan. I'm a part of the research support team for the All of Us Research Program for the Researcher Workbench. Uh, myself and a handful of my colleagues on the team are the ones who help build out the user support hub and all the other research um, support materials that you guys can view to, to start to learn the workbench, as well as we man the help desk. Um, and are answering those questions, those amazing questions you guys plug in. Um, so today uh, I put together a few slides and in, in an overview of the cloud environment and in storage. This has become somewhat of a, a hot topic lately, and I think it's a great opportunity to explain and, and you know just give an overview of what's going on for those who may not already know. Getting into the slides here, today's agenda, as you can see broken down here, is we're going to do an overview of the cloud. Um, think of it as where's the data stored being the CDR, Curated Data Repository. We'll do an overview of cloud environments, um, so configuring in the terminal, you know, what is the environment. And then we'll do an overview of the storage and different ways to store, say, based off of the different environments you've created. Then we'll do another brief overview of cloud environment cost and computation. Then we'll go uh, have some time for a live walkthrough to be very brief. And then, of course, time for questions at the end. So overview of the cloud. So the curated data repository or the, the CDR is securely contained in what is called Google BigQuery. So this is a secure web-based platform that holds all of our data. Now, the great thing about the CDR is this is where you access both the register tier and control tier data. So it's all coming from the same place, no matter what workspace you're in, in the researcher workbench or what uh, type of data access you have. And so how do we get data from Google BigQuery up in the cloud in a secure environment down into a notebook to work on. Uh, that's where SQL comes into play, where you'll query data down into your notebook. And we'll explore this some more, but as you can see down there in the bottom left of my screen is how do you bring in the CDR? There's a couple different ways, um, but two of the most common ways when talking about the uh, registered tier, control tier data is you can either use the CDR variable name workspace underscore CDR, or you can use the explicit data set name. And as you see, it's written out here. Uh, for example, the latest registered tier data set name is FC AOU CDR prod dot R 2022 Q2 R6. That tag at the end, the R 2022 Q2 R6 is the piece that changes based off the data, data set in the version. Uh, so for example, if we go back to our previous version, it would, the tag at the end would probably be R5. So just to give you guys some context around uh, how the CDRs are named. So here's an example of what it would look like if you were to use SQL in a notebook to pull data from the CDR on your own manually. So I've given two examples in each um, code that you can use coding language being Python or R in the, the Jupyter Notebooks, and we'll explore this more later. So here in this first example, I wanna point out, so I use the environment variable name workspace CDR, and I named it data set. And as you see, it outputs that very explicit data set name. Then I can also name and just pull in that explicit data set name. And then I just want to show an example of how they are actually the same. So then I ran a very simple query, pulling some survey data. And the key here is that I used, in my query, I used data set. And then I got a number of, I blocked out the end just because we don't want to be too specific here because this will be publicly available. But we got a number of over 360,000 participants. And we jumped down here in the second query I made, I actually used data set underscore one. So just showing for the first query, I used workspace variable. For the second query, I used the explicit name, but I still got the same count. 
So here I just wanted to show that either or can be used. The key difference here is that using the workspace variable is always going to choose the latest version of the data set. However, for those who are not uh, too familiar with SQL um, and maybe you don't intend on learning it, that is totally okay. We've actually automated all that for you. So using the data set builder, you know, you've built your cohort, you've selected concept sets, and you've actually selected the columns you want to use. You click analyze, and boom, we automatically generate the SQL needed to pull this data set. And it includes all the uh, pieces of packages needed to run the code as well as establishing the workspace variable name in your code. Uh, Gage? Yes. A quick quick question here since you are here. Uh, so before hitting analyze, if you if if you go go back one slide. Yeah. Uh, before hitting analyze or, or or that slide, we can view this table. Is this table can we save this table somewhere? So that we can see with commands or not, because I cannot see that option. Uh, when we analyze, we have to uh, open a Jupyter notebook, and that's where we import it. But we cannot save it. So is it by default that we cannot save these things? Great question. So yeah, there's no way. Um, as in, if you were to select this preview table tab, that's strictly what it is. Is just a preview of the table, and it drops it down um, in this section four area here. Uh, there is no way to, let's say, save that particular table of what you're viewing at that time. Um, what you need to do is a click analyze, bring the code into the Jupyter Notebook, and then from there you can save the data set for permanent use later on. Good question, though. Just to reiterate, um, so the preview table function is more to do with um, getting only a certain number of participants, not your entire cohort. And the preview table gets all columns that, that you have chosen. M maybe you're not interested in all that. It's too much of useless data in general from my perspective. So, so we cannot save that table because you might potentially have 100,000 rows or 200,000 rows. We don't know. So preview table is just for that function of preview. In general, do you see things that you actually want to see in that? That's all, that's all it is for. You can also, in, where, where Gage has shown to generate this notebook, you can also preview this SQL. So -hmm. sometimes you may not want this whole SQL. You may want to scroll down and grab a certain portion that you are interested in. Like in this case, for example, as you're seeing on the screen, uh, Gage here has selected person ID, gender concept, uh you know name okay he didn't choose the gender concept id for example because he didn't care about that he just wanted to know what gender is i don't care whether the number is one two eight five six or not but depends on what you want right so there is a certain only a few columns that you actually need that you take obviously in certain cases you you might want to have the concept id you might not it depends on your uh, on your use case and your own research uh, goals Right. So if you want to see how how it joins on different tables, you can look at the you can look at that particular um, preview. Uh, there is a there's a there's a review pane. There's there's a SQL pane where you can review the SQL. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this, you don't have to go all the way to the notebook if you don't want to. Yeah, uh, I'll see if I can in our live walk walk through preview that piece too. Chinchal, thanks for bringing that up. Moving on, uh, we just talked about the overview of the cloud. Now we're gonna start narrowing down and we'll start talking about the cloud environment itself. And what does that mean? So what is a cloud analysis environment and why is it needed? So your analysis environment is consisted of an application and compute resources. Your cloud environment is unique to this workspace or your particular workspace and not shared with other users. Um, and then more on, an analysis environment creates a virtual machine or a VM that allows you to both connect to Google BigQuery and a Jupyter Notebooks. And then as this like little illustration I've put is essentially uh, the cloud environment uh, puts up this safeguard wall, this green circle, which allows you to make that connection between 
BigQuery in the notebook and be able to communicate um, and pull data in and run data on the Jupyter notebook. So now I'm gonna walk through particularly a, a few different pieces of this, but what I'm showing here is the terminal window uh, of the cloud analysis environment. Um, and so there's a bunch of different pieces here that you can change and customize based off the type of environment that you want. Um, but we also do have this pre-built pre -built out in the recommended cases. So um, by no means do you have to customize this. It is ready to go. Uh, but if you find that there, you know, you are needing to do bigger queries or anything like that, this is where you'll come to do some customization. And so how do you access this window from the workspace uh, environment? You'll click the ThunderCloud icon here and it'll open up this window. So first thing we'll talk about here is this top bar. Uh, so this is gonna show the status of the environment. Then it's also gonna show the price per hour uh, while actively running the price per hour in a pause state. And then it'll also show how many credits you have if you are using the uh, free credits that we've allotted as initial credits. Um, and so revisiting right here back to the status of your environment, if it's green, that means it's active. If it's yellow, it means it's paused. And if it's uh, gray, that means there's nothing started at all. Then jumping down to the next thing would be this menu here, which there's going to be two options when you drop this down for recommended environments. It would be general analysis and then um, genomic analysis or, or, yeah, genomic analysis. And so these are the two recommended environments that you could choose from quickly um, if you don't want to do the full customization on your own. Moving on, you have the ability to edit the CPUs or central processing units, as well as the RAM. So you can increase those or you can increase the RAM. Then you also have the option to enable GPUs or graphic processing units to um, you know, take place of those CPUs. Um, you know, If you are doing a lot of type of um, later on imaging within your notebook, you may need to enable those. And then the last thing on this left diagram that I want to show, talk about is the automatically pause after idle. So you can change the amount of time that is allotted before uh, your notebook goes into a pause state. Um, so the default is 30 minutes, um, but you can extend that out into multiple hours if you want to be able to step away from your 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 computer for let's say an hour at a time and know that your notebook is gonna stay active. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you are doing this, uh, an active notebook does cost more than a pause notebook. So you're just, if you're not actively using it, but it is in an active state, you're gonna be incurring more costs than it would if it automatically pushes to a pause state. Then moving over here. So this screenshot is just taken from what's below. Um, in the terminal window is you have the option to either move forward with the standard disk or you can attach a persistent disk. And we'll get into more detail about this later on, um, but you also have the ability to increase the disk size too. So now that we uh, talked about the ways you can customize the terminal and get your environment set up for what you're looking to use, I do just kind of want to put this out there and talk about the lifespan of your environment. So environments are not intended to be a forever case. When you start one, that's not the only environment you'll ever use for that workspace. Environments are actually currently, now I say currently because this could change in the future, but right now environments are automatically deleted either two weeks after original creation or seven days of inactivity, whichever one comes first. Like I said, this may change in the future, but it does not change our recommended practices for this. So this is what I kind of like to say is um, if you are not actively using the notebook or the environment and you are going to step away for an extended amount of time, uh, it's recommended to go ahead and turn it off or delete it. 
can think of it as like a light switch. Uh, when you leave the room, you turn the lights off. When you come back into the room, you turn them on. Um, and so you can manually delete your environment from that window that we were just viewing and then going to the bottom and clicking delete environment. And then uh, this was in, this is also in the terminal window as part of the customization is the type of environment you can start up. So currently we have two types of environments. We have a standard VM and we have a data prop cluster. Um, and then just the difference between the two and what you may use them for is a standard VM. These are typically all data outside of genomics data. Um, it's where you'll run traditional R and Python coding. Um, you can also use DSUB, Nextflow, and Cromwell in this type of environment. And it's good for running single jobs at a time. The data proc cluster type of environment is where you'll do traditionally genomic data analysis, either using uh, HAIL or, or Spark, and it's also where you'll run uh, parallel jobs. Can I ask a quick question here, please? Sure. Yeah, so I am writing a proposal um, currently for NIH, and I want to have the, the cost estimate, um, you know, to use this if we get awarded uh, for, Mm -hmm. say i think three to five years uh and um uh, i want to use microsoft azure so we got a calculator online and we calculated the cost uh, so there's well-built calculator i also want to use uh, all of us for the genomic data pre-processing and um you know applying some machine learning uh, techniques on that so how will i calculate the cost for AOU? Is there a calculator built in here or uh, is there a different place that I want to go and yeah. do that? Great question. Um, so we don't have a pre-built calculator. What, what you can do though is one of my colleagues will definitely be able to share this too with you is we do have some examples, some notebooks, pre-built notebooks, projects that have already been run and it'll give you the cost as it'll give you the cost of what it takes to run that example notebook with the way they set up their environment. So you can use that as a piece. And then you can also okay. use, as I showed, I'll jump back a few screens here. So here, once you've set up the environment, you can see what it costs per hour in an active environment, what it costs in a pause state. Now is that, um, okay. it's just a piece to help. So you can okay. rough estimate how long you may be working on this. Uh, the reason why we don't have an exact calculator is because there is so much customization and, and changing with the way the the platform is built up. Is that mm -hmm. it? It would be it would be hard to be able to get every variable in there to to explain exactly how much it'll cost. Um, okay. So I hope that yeah. makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, so where would I get the um, you know the snapshots of the projects, those who are already running and they have some cost estimates. Yeah, um, it, I'm sure they'll plug it into the chat. So if you just take a look there, um, they'll throw that in there for you. But great question. Yep, got it, thank you. Yeah. Um, so now moving on from the environments, uh, let's talk a little bit about storage, cloud storage and uh, disk storage. Uh, so currently, right now, these are the three storage paths that we have. Starting in the middle here, we have a standard disk. And then on the outside branches, we have the workspace bucket, which is a cloud storage system. And then we have a persistent disk, which can be thought of a thumb drive type of or USB drive system. I'll go into more detail about each of these. Um, but like I've been saying, I do want to put out there as a disclaimer, uh, there is talk about the standard disk may being removed in the future. Um, so this could change as you continue to work in the workbench. So since it still is active, we're gonna talk about the standard disk here first. So this is the, the default storage location. Um, it is specific to the current environment. Uh, it will be deleted when your environment is deleted. So the best way to think of it is it's uh, like scratch space or scratch storage. 
Um, and then files can be listed using commands or located within the Jupyter window. Uh, I'll show that in a couple of screenshots here. And then the storage area, it, uh, the storage area in order to download, meaning, and I'll explain this more, but meaning this is where you'll put a file uh, let's say you want to download a summary statistic or a summary figure, you'll put a file here in the standard disk and then you can access it to then click it to download. So here's just a couple screenshots. This is what it looked like when I mean um, this is the default storage system. Let's say you have a PNG figure you created and then use the command GG save to save it. If you don't direct it anywhere else, it'll automatically go to the standard disk space. And then when I was mentioning about how to access these files, um, you'll come here and within the notebook, you'll click the Jupyter icon or you could click file and open. It'll bring up these files. Then you'll click on the workspaces here and then you'll be able to see all those files that you've saved to the standard disk. And then what I mean by downloading is then you'll have an opportunity to click this X and then click a download function. And that'll bring it onto your local drive. Um, and then this might be a good time too, if any of my colleagues have it available, is our data and statistics dissemination policy, meaning yes, we encourage the, the researchers to download items as long as they follow our policies being no row level data can leave the workbench um, as well as we do not want to publish any numbers under 20. So now we talked about standard disk, let's move to the workspace bucket or kind of like the cloud permanent cloud storage system of your, your workspace. <clears throat> so workspace bucket requires code to send files back and forth. And don't worry, we've pre-built these codes for you in the form of code snippets. This is the storage system is specific to your workspace. Um, so it is permanent storage and it is shareable to with anybody who has access to your workspace. So this is the best storage system if you have multiple people working in a workspace and you need to share files back and forth when you save it up to the workspace bucket then anybody else who then later on accesses the workspace and the notebook can pull this file out of the workspace bucket. Um, so yes, and then also files can be moved between notebooks. So if you have mul multiple notebooks within one workspace, because it all shares the same workspace bucket, you can put files up to the workspace from one notebook and then bring them back down into a new notebook. So some screenshots here, as I was explaining, is the code snippets portion uh, is in your, your Jupyter notebook. There's a snippets. And you can come down to, uh, you know, all of us are in cloud storage snippets. Um, it says R because that's the type of notebook I was in. If you were in Python, it'd say Python. Um, and then you'll want to run the setup first. And then it gives you options here to list the objects in the workspace bucket or to copy files to and from the workspace bucket. Um, and then here's just an example of what the code looks like. So you click setup. This would be the setup piece. Um, and then this is an example of sending a file up to the bucket. So this is the output. Like I said, you don't have to do, you don't have to write anything out in here. All you got to do is read along and change out some variable names to make sure you're putting the right uh, file in there. So we talked about the workspace bucket. We're going to move on to our third option for, for storage, and that's the persistent disk. Uh, so this is default storage when it is attached and i'll show you what it looks like to attach it uh you know later on live but it would be in that terminal window and you'd click uh, retachable persistent disk so once that's attached it is the default storage system it doesn't take any extra commands to send something to it so the persistent disk is specific to the researcher and the workspace so it is not shareable between other researchers even though you may share the workspace with other colleagues, the persistent disk is personable to your specific account. It is permanent storage, however, so you can delete the environment and the persistent disk will stay there. And then you can reattach it again to uh, a different environment. And then as I said, so files can be listed using the commands or located within the Jupyter window um, the same way as the standard disk. And then this can also be acted as a way to download items too, because you can access it through the Jupyter icon. You can select those files to then download. 
So what are some big takeaways of what I've kind of discussed just recently, uh, especially when talking about storage is, if you look down the first column for the standard disk, you can run a standard environment or you can run a data proc, data proc cluster environment. However, your standard disk does not allow for permanent storage and it does not allow for sharing between other colleagues. Moving on to your persistent disk. You can use it for a standard environment. However, it is not capable within a data proc cluster environment at the moment. It is permanent storage, uh, but it is not shareable. And moving on to the third column for the workspace bucket, you can use it in a standard environment, a data proc cluster environment. It is permanent storage and it can be shareable. So now that we talked about storage, uh, another big topic that comes up and that I'd just like to address is overview of cost um, and computation. And what does cost mean? So first of all, the only cost associated with the workbench is cost for running a live environment. There is no cost associated with getting access to the workbench or using the point and click tools, meaning the cohort builder or data set builder. You only start incurring cost uh, once you start an environment because that takes computational resources. So this is a very general type of uh, equation I put up here of how cost can be calculated. Uh, do not quote me on this, but this is just kind of what makes sense to me and hopefully can make sense to you guys is cost comes from how much data you're pulling, plus the type of compute uh, resources that you're using and for how long you're using them. Plus, there's also a storage factor. So if you're doing permanent storage, there is cost associated with that. Um, and so as you can see up here, these are just examples of, you know, different costs. Uh, so a general, a very general uh, low resource environment, uh, you know, four CPUs, 15 gigabytes uh, uh, of RAM, um, and 120 gigabytes of disk space is going to be 20 cents per hour to run and only yet yeah, one cent per hour in a pause state. However, you can see the drastic change here. If you're running a, uh, if you enable GPUs in your environment and you increase the CPUs and you increase the RAM, you're looking at could be $20 per hour to run this type of environment. Um, but the pause state is still very little. And then over here would be if you're running a data proc cluster type of environment for uh, hail analysis, you can see that the cost goes up a little bit here per hour. So everything varies greatly on the way you build out your environments. And then it also varies greatly on how much data you're pulling and then how much data you're storing. Uh, 